Oye, mi gente, How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good. And Elva, tell us about yourself. Well, born in Peru, in the Sierra, in uh, Huancavelica, a little town named Chiris. 
and moved to Apurimac Chincheros. That's where I grew up. That's where I learned to speak this beautiful language, Quechua, by listening to people in the community, listening to my father and my mother and neighbors. And that. So I learned to love this language. Okay, awesome. Y um, cómo se sienten? Like, how, how are you guys feeling? Um, right now? Yeah, right now. How are no, you guys well, feeling? I, I, I'm excited because on Saturday we had our, our one of our events that we we do yearly. Um, it was nice. We call it Sumac. It's a bingo game, big bingo, but in Quechua. So we call it sumac bingo. So it, it was nice. It, you know, it, it's a opportunity to present this language to other people who never uh, came before. So new people came. So that was very nice. Okay. How's your spirit? Como están sus espíritu? Well, right now I am kind of motivated I'm um, feeling good about what we're doing. Um, yeah, and we, we're creating lots of things. We're working. We have our get you a school. We have, um, we are writing books. Uh, we do events, um, different kinds of events. One of them is Sumac, and the other one is our retreat, annual retreat, where we gather people who are interested in knowing and learning Quechua language. And um, what else we do? We're also oh, right. um, we're, we're involved in recently some community initiatives um, in partnership with uh, the New York City Office of Immigration Affairs. Right, um, right. We're hoping to bring Quechua awareness and the Quechua language <coughs> to things like Know Your Rights, um, to things like just general information about um, IDs, uh, what you need to have and what you don't need to have, or you know, just to make things clear for indigenous speaking communities. Um, and we're also interested in, um, Elva had recently come up with some kind of partnership, perhaps, where she could talk to people who are involved on the legal side of people. Um, mm -hmm. So we could make them more aware of um, our culture and how to treat people from our culture. Awesome. So, Elva, how was your journey into the U.S.? Well, it's a long story. But to make it short, maybe I'll say that uh, I came to this country out of the necessity, economic necessity of my family, because um, at that time when I came, which was in 1964, my father was ill. My mother never really worked to earn money, a regular job, so she was just taking care of her children and the family. And um, my sister, my older sister, had come here before uh, because one of our cousins came in, uh, in, in a sheep and uh, with a marine uh, uncle. So he brought my sister, my older sister, here. Um, after that, uh, what she was uh, making, the money that she was making was not enough. So she needed somebody to come from my family. <clears throat> so I came to help because my parents had 10 children and with no job and with my father ill, it was not really a good situation. Uh, well, I came here in 1964, and since then, after I work in factories, uh, you know, uh, sewing garments and stuff like that, exploited uh, very, very badly because um, 
I just had high school when I came here. You go, I was young, about 19 years old. And um, I couldn't, I, I didn't know English. I only spoke Spanish. So it was difficult to get other jobs. So I only went to the factory and um, very badly treated. It, it's a big exploitation, you know? They pay us nothing, and we work very, very hard. Um, but from there, uh, I was married when I came. And shortly after me, my husband came. And here we began our family. My daughter was born, and my son, so I have two children. And we um, started uh, working and going to school because I, I wanted to learn um, the language in the first place so I can survive because if you don't know the language, you're exploited worse. Yeah. Do you think that, um, you know, they say that the U.S. is this big land of, like, opportunity where you can just come and right away you're going to have a great job, be paid well, live in a great house, and you're going to pay a little bit of rent. How was that reality for you when you came to the U.S. and it wasn't like that? Oh, with two starters. I hated to come to this country. <laughs> Not only the country, but the language, English. I did not like this language. I did not like the United States because in South America, at that time, we saw the United States as the capitalist uh, empire that exploits everywhere else in Latin America. That's the way we perceived. But out of the necessity, I end up being here. So I had to learn everything uh, from the language, education. I, I went to school, I studied, uh, and I, I obtained my bachelor's degree. And work always. Uh, after the factory, I went to work to a daycare center and then, then the public school. Mm. So I became a teacher too. So it was difficult raising my two children. And um, um, then separated from my husband. So, you know, it was difficult. Uh, yeah, and uh, that, that's um, the story. Um, and now how I became involved in Quechua. It's, it's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jessica, you know, how was your journey? So, my journey is much different. Um, I did not come here by choice. Um, I was adopted, uh, and I came, I've been living here since I was three months old, uh, as you previously mentioned in my biography. So, my journey is much, much different, although, of course, I am still an immigrant. Um, but I was adopted by white parents and raised um, in a white community. So although I'm an immigrant, I, my story is so much different than Elvis and so much different than many immigration stories because I was afforded a lot of opportunities um, due to my adoption. And do you remember, like, like where exactly in Peru are you from? Like, So I'm from Abancay, um, and I... I was there, I was with my mother for about three weeks, um, and then while waiting to come to the U.S., I lived in Cusco with a foster family. Um, I have no memory, but my family and I are in contact, and I visit um, frequently. I'm there every year uh, for a month to visit my family. Has, have you guys talked about, you know, like why, you know, she gave you up? So um, one of the reasons why my mother gave me up was because of this perception of the U.S. being able to afford me a better life. Um, now, that being said, she was also deceived in the fact that she thought that I would be returning. 
Um, and also she was deceived in the fact that she was in poorer health than she was. And she thought that she was making the best decision based on the facts that were given to her. Although being a Quechua speaking illiterate woman, um, you know, she faced a lot of marginalization and she wasn't able to really understand the decision that she was making. And she's verbalized that to me um, since then. So how was it for you growing up? Like, did you um, did you go grow up with this perception that you were white or did you know that you were different from your white parents? Um, I definitely knew that I was different, um, but my parents made no secret of my adoption. I actually think it would be impossible um, for it to be a secret because we do not look alike. It was very difficult for me to grow up um, because one of the one of the things that my parents did actually when I was around 11 years old was they wanted to move me to a better school district. And we had actually um, grown up in an area where there was a lot of Latinos um, and other individuals of color in my neighborhood, but the school district was not so great. So my parents decided to move um, to a place where there was a better school district. And of course, that area happened to be um, a predominantly white community. So that was very difficult for me. Um, and it's also just difficult to know that something is different. I have also, I have, um, a white family and all that comes with that. And sometimes, I mean, a lot of my family right now um, are Trump supporters. So you can imagine what that's like um, as myself, because um, a lot of the times when people, especially my family or really anyone, don't see me as I really am because they've grown up with one perception of me, um, they can oftentimes say a lot of hurtful and ignorant things. Um, and it's, it's hard to come to terms with that. Um, but as anyone, whether it be um, someone who was transracially adopted or someone who's mixed, um, can definitely re relate to growing up in an environment like that. <laughs> How was it for you growing up with the media that we had I mean like the representation of Peruvian culture like it was almost non-existent so how did you make it your business to you know learn where you were from so I didn't I have to say that I really it's not that necessarily that I didn't care I knew that I was Peruvian but what did that matter it was growing up in the environment that I did um there's there was one other South American person in my graduating class, um, my husband. Uh, um. And um, and in terms of, like, Latino individuals in our school, uh, maybe, like, 10, if that, out of mm. a pretty large school district. So not only was there no representation in the media, there was no representation in my everyday life. When I met Elva, she was, like, the first Peruvian person maybe that I also had ever talked to. I, I know my mom had a coworker um, when I was growing up who was Peruvian. So we, we didn't have a relationship though. So like I knew maybe like that other Peruvian person and then Elva. <laughs> and Elva, like, and you almost having to grow up again, living in the U.S., how were you able to function pretty much not having any type of representation, not really knowing any other Peruvian person but your husband mm -hmm. and your sister? Um, right. Um, to starters, I cried for 15 years oh. after I arrived to this country because I miss my family in Peru, I miss my culture because I'm very much involved in the culture of Peru. I love the music, I love the dances, I love people in Peru, at least in the place where I lived. Um, so I cried every day because I miss everything. Mm -hmm. And um, Life here was not as uh, they said. You can find uh, 
the dollars on trees falling to the streets. And that's not how it is. Reality yeah. is something else. So it was hard and um, uh, I don't know. I just survive. I I am a person that, uh, you know, I uh, get myself involved. I got involved in the community. Uh, even not knowing the English, I was a PTA president after my children were in school um, for four years, four consecutive years. I, I knew no English, but people wanted me to be their president. So I accepted. It was a big challenge. And there was a woman who was white who ran against me and she said, but uh, how could you be running for, to be a president of the PTA? You don't know how to speak English. Mm. And I said, look, the school, and I had somebody to translate. The school has a translator and she's going to say what I want to say to everybody, so everybody's gonna know what how I think. Awesome. So that woman was so, so, I don't know how to describe her, but she was so angry that she took her, her child from school and left. Wow, like completely removed. Removed, removed. because uh, wow. all of the people, Latinos and, um, and blacks and whites supported me. They wanted me to be their uh, spokesperson. They almost kind of like felt represented through yeah. you. They they felt good seeing me talking for the rights of the students. And um, that's how I, you know, I became four years. They want me to be there. That's the time that my children were in school. That's awesome. So I, I had a really, um, in, my, in my half English, I, uh, I survived. Uh, I didn't care about that because, um, you know, people could be very hurtful when they are prejudiced. Definitely. Right. So, Elba, how did, how did you start the Quechua Collective? Like, where <laughs> did the idea form to start this collective? Okay, we have to go back to... I, I lived in Bergen Street for a while when I came from um, Peru. Uh, and then I moved to Park Slope. Um, and when I was in Park Slope, I visited the Grand Army Plaza Library mm -hmm. and became involved with people in the library uh, to build a um, center, inter, was, was it International Language Center? Mm -hmm. So I liked the idea because I thought, oh, we can bring books in Quechua. Mm. So that was my, my idea, and I got involved doing that. So once I was involved, well, my son decided that, uh, you know, we to move to Queens. So we bought a house, and we moved from here to Queens. And I left that organization, but I didn't see the fruits of it yet. Mm -hmm. Well, five years passed. When I was in Queens, I came back, and the first thing I did was to go to Grand Army Plaza Library and, and went and see, oh, here is the International Language Center. So uh, I went there looking for Quechua books. Nothing. One, somewhere we have one little survival, uh, uh, li uh, survival dictionary. Mm. Geared for tourists. This side. Wow. For tourists. That was the only book in that library. 
They have books of all the languages. Except for... Except the one that I wanted to see, Quechua. So I got mad. I got angry. I started doing something about it. At that time, I met Christine Maladic from NYU. And... Um, Two of us, you know, she she was motivating me. Look, you feel so strongly about bringing books in this library. Why don't we do something about it? I'll help you, she said. Okay. So I started going to the library, asking who should I go to if I want to donate books in Quechua. And I started doing that. So I asked my um, brother-in-law in Bolivia, to send me some um, books in Quechua. So I received a big pack, box full of books. So it was really, really wonderful. So very happy. I went to the library director and I said, I want to donate all of these books to the library because you don't have any books in this language. That director said to me, we cannot accept your donation, because it cost a lot of money for us to process before we put the books in the shelves. And we don't have the money. And it, at that time, it was Katrina, was it, that uh, wiped out all the cost of uh, Coney Island and all mm -hmm. that? Okay, they said the money that they had they were build, rebuilding libraries around there. Mm. And because of that, they cannot spend any money on everything else, anything else. So because of that reason, they rejected my books. But I went back, and I went back like about five times, and finally they, they accepted, mm -hmm. I think, 10 books out of 30. Wow. And uh, I don't know if they put it here in the main branch because they said that they were going to do it in Sunset Park. But anyway, I said to them, we cannot just leave the books there and people will not know about it. So I decided that we have to do something um, to make it public. So we asked the library again. We said, we need the space so we can have a Raimi to introduce these books to the community. So I went back again, back and forth, back and forth to the library. Finally, they gave me the Sunset Park Library to the, as a space, the space to do our Raimi. Mm -hmm. So we had our first Raimi. That was in uh, 2012. And what June does... June 2012. What does Raimi mean for those Raimi that are listening? Raimi means fiesta, mm. party. So we had our first fiesta in Sunset Park as a Raimi Andino. Um, from there, that came from there. Mm -hmm. You didn't know? <laughs> yeah, he was there. Yeah, he was there. And that's, we have 100 people. Mm -hmm that gathered there to, because we had music also. And the music played by Inca Raiku. And uh, we talk about the books. We talk about the language and why, because uh, Quechua is one of the languages that is in the list to be uh, extinguished. Extinguished, that's the word? No? Yeah, uh, pretty yeah. much. So I couldn't allow that to happen. So I said that I will do anything in my power to help to preserve this book, this uh, language. Um, with that idea in mind is where we, we began our uh, organization. That was K New York Quechua Collect, no. New York Quechua Initiative. New York Quechua Initiative. And what year was this? Oh, 212. Okay. 212. June 212. That was our first Raimi. Then from then on, every year we had Raimis, we had other activities, and um, people know us, um, and we had many 
interviews, colleges, and uh, even radios, television um, interviewed us. And uh, Remezcla. Yeah, Remezcla. Yeah. yeah, that's where I got, like, your, your name from. How important is it to be properly represented? Well... Uh, we are not represented at all, anywhere. Um, Don Francisco, um, you know, I was really uh, very disappointed when he presented uh, someone as a Peruvian to do salsa. Mm -hmm. What is that? I mean, and he is from where? Where is he from? From Chile? He, well, actually, he is not Chileno. I think he grew up in Chile, but he's actually German. Well, but the thing is, you know, he didn't even know what the culture of Peru is, what the indigenous people, what the music is, mm -hmm. you know? So he's going to bring salsa, merengue as Peruvian? Yeah, no. That's, you know, I wanted to go and tell him, you know, hey, you know you're making such a big mistake. But but that that's how, you know, ignorant people are about Peruvian cultures. Yeah. I mean, I had someone recently, I was shopping at Trader Joe's. Um, I'm a big fan of salsa. So um, when I say that, I mean like the Americanized version of salsa, not just like sauce, because that's what salsa yeah. actually means. Um, I was shopping and I was picking up a lot of salsa, as I always do. And the cashier, the white cashier, the, the, the name of the salsa that I like in Trader Joe's is called Salsa Identica. And he was like, oh, is this like actually authentic? As Peruvians, we don't eat that. That's Mexican. So yeah. for me, for him to just like base off on the way I look to ask me, like, is this authentic? I don't know. Because I know that um, when I'm actually, when I'm in Peru, salsa is one of the things that I really miss because it's not Peruvian. But once again, it's just ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when Laura Bolso came on the screen mm -hmm. how did it how did that make you feel personally well she's a person who doesn't care about how she speaks she just tells her views her way and is very aggressive very sometimes very demeaning to people and actually she she couldn't work in as in, in Peru she had to come to Mexico because Mexico um, embraced her right yeah um, I I really sometimes I will watch it but I don't like it because it's very vulgar and she doesn't put the Peru Peruvians as they are. Uh, she doesn't represent Peru. She represents Mexico, no? Yeah, Mexico now. So. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, exploitation um, that happens in the communities that she gets these people from mm -hmm. and i believe that even though that they are our brethren um what happens a lot in peru it develops this certain type of classism yeah where we know that our country is heavily indigenous and there's also a lot of afro-peruvians uh, some Peruvians tend to look down on these people. And why do you think that is, that Peruvians well, tend to do that? It's very much um, uh, 
racism, you know, among each other. Like people um, in the coast of Peru, uh, they don't want to be called um, Serrano because Serrano is supposed to be less than the people in the coast. La costa es, es Talima y uh -huh. entonces este, los serranos somos los cholos, somos los ignorantes, somos los uh, ociosos, somos, uh, well, they call us many names yeah. to the serranos. But the people in Lima and in the coast are different. And people from the provinces come to Lima. And even though they don't even speak Spanish well enough, they don't want to be, they don't want to say, I am from the Sierra. I mm. am provinciano. They say, I'm from Lima. Mm. I have people here who I know are not from, from Lima. They are from the Sierra, from somewhere. Where are you from, I ask them. And say, yo soy de Lima. Where are, where did your parents came from? Then I know. From Huancayo, from Apurímac, from Ayacucho. Ah, then you are Serrano, you are Serrana. Because your parents came from other parts, not from Lima. You must have been born in Lima, but your roots are Andinos. Mm -hmm. You know, but we learn, I mean, people in in Lima kind of uh, put down to people who came from this, the Andes, from the Sierra, you know, from the provinces. Mm -hmm. So people are ashamed. So, you know, they, they are ashamed to say they are serranos, they are provincianos. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Peruvian uh, media has a lot of responsibility of in course. that? Yes. They have a lot of responsibility. Lately, you know, the program um, of uh, Saiwa, mm -hmm. she's doing a good job, I, I think, because she's bringing people um, from all over. Um, and um, having them sing the music from the Andes of Peru, mm -hmm. and which is very nice. Um, but before that, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I didn't live in Peru, in Lima, that mm -hmm. long. I only lived in Lima for about uh, six years. And uh, from I was born... And then, then taken to Lima and lived only one year. And after a year, they took me to Chincheros Apurímac. Mm -hmm. So I lived in Apurímac 14 years of my life. There is where I learned uh, Quechua. And after that, I came back to Lima, and I only lived in Lima a few years, maybe, maybe four years, and came to this country. So, I mean, I think it's absolutely crazy from the representation that we see um, in Latin America across the television shows, across the telenovelas, down to the pictures on the boxes of the baby diapers. And I've questioned this and I was taught my sister recently had a baby and I was down there and we were visiting last summer and I was like, you know, Hermana, like, why are all of these, like, did you ever stop and think, like, why are these babies white? Like, it's one thing, and it's still a problem in the United States um, when, you know, there's, you know, majority of the babies are white on the di diaper boxes or the pictures that are on the diapers. But why in a country where majority of the people are not white or light-skinned like, that is the representation that we're seeing. I think it's crazy. And I think that it all feeds into um, our, especially, like, the people in countries, our negative perceptions of ourselves mm -hmm. um, yeah. and our skin. Yeah, yeah like, um, I mean, Jessica, you were there at the community uh, resource fair where I spoke about um, 
topic of racism. And we were taught at a very young age anything darker than a paper bag isn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, like even by our own people, even, you know, like it's, I've observed that even in indigenous countries, uh, um, in indigenous land, that they have been so um, compromised, their way of thinking is so compromised, where it's like the only way to levantar la raza is to lighten the, you know, bloodline. Mm -hmm. How has that like played out for you like have you guys you know been taught that growing up i um um in brazil most um mostly i i knew uh how this was i was i lived there for a month uh and there uh there were conferences that spoke about the blank Brankification. Mm. That means the the black people will mix with white uh, in order to make um, their skin lighter. Mm. And uh, I don't know about Peru, but I know about Brazil. It was very heavy. That's why um, there were people who had really a dark a skin with blue eyes, mm-hmm. green eyes, and and their hair will be um, goldish. Curly. Kind of. Yeah. In Brazil, that's what happens because of the mixed of races. Mm-hmm. But in Peru, I haven't seen that much of mixed. My family definitely is like you're either you either look really indigenous Mm -hmm. or you look really black Mm -hmm. there's me who i have indigenous features but then i'm darker than my indigenous family but then i'm also not black enough to be considered like Mm afro-peruana You know, I have family members who are a little lighter than me, but their hair is like super, super curly that only, you know, the curls that black people tend Mm -hmm. to have. Um, I also want to ask um, how. How do you feel about the leaders in the Latin Americas not caring about the importance of indigenous preservation? Hmm. It's very sad how the indigenous people are being treated due to the expansion of um, business industrialization and uh, you know they they are even burning their fields, the less um, the jungles, the rainforest, the rainforest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're burning in order to to scare the uh, the indigenous people away, so mm-hmm. they can uh, buy not buy just go in and uh, possess the land and uh, uh, do something else. And um, it's very sad to see that, you know, the industrialization of the countries everywhere. In, um, they don't care. They just straight up no. don't care. No. They don't care here either for the native people in this land in the United no. States. And they no. don't care at home where we're all from. Don't care. Definitely. Like, you know, since Peru has been named you know, one of the seven wonders of the world, you know, Machu Picchu. Um, I read about uh, what they're trying to do in sacred land in Chincheros. Mm -hmm. They're trying to build um, an airport over sacred land to make it easier uh, for 
these soul searching people to travel there just to get to the ruins a little faster how how can building that airport damage like how much damage are they really doing to these lands to starters the people were displaced from their land push away i don't know where they went i don't know where people went um and they have to leave their lands in order to give it to the builders of the airport um that's one but then also the pollution is affecting the whole la fauna mm -hmm. the 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 I know this lady who came from Cusco, justamente de Chinchero. Mm -hmm. uh, she tells me that um, we used to have duraznos, we used to have capulis, mm -hmm. we used to have these trees, and we used to gather them. And now there's nothing. The trees are dead. Even in, in the place where I live, I went on 212 there, and, and I found the, the retamas, who, which were the flower of Peru. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the Andean flower, typical Andean flower, the retama. They're all dying mm -hmm. because of the pollution. They uh, develop this illness. So it's, you know, the, the plants' leaves are all black. Mm -hmm. And it's being destroyed. Because of the oil. Because of uh, the pollution. I don't know which kind of pollution is coming, where it's coming from. I don't know. Maybe because in Chincheros, when I used to live there, when I was a child, uh, it was beautiful. But now, when I went back after 25 years, 30 years or more mm -hmm. is totally the pollution the the river that used to be nice and cristalino now is all dirty mm. it, it's bad i really heartbreaking uh, uh, yeah to me it's very sad i can't uh, you know the trees, the plants dying, and the and the water is is so dirty. How could plants live like that? It's it's safe to say that tourism can be both great but toxic at the same time. Yeah, mostly it's toxic. <laughs> People can say that. Parts of colonialism are great, but overall it was really toxic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you know, we're getting a lot of visitors, money is going up, but the reality is our lands are getting polluted. I, I really don't... Who owns Peru now? Is mm. the Chilenos. Mm. See. Si. They, um, Machu Picchu is not Peruvian anymore. I don't think so. I think they had, uh, como is it, rented to Chile for I don't know how many years. So they're exploiting the tourism to Chile. go to Machu Picchu, and Chile is getting rich. So not even Peru? No, no. Chile. Peru did not have that kind of money to redevelop the touristic areas. Wow, I did not know that. Even in Lima, those supermercados, mm. it's not Peruvian people who is doing it. They are from Chile. I think tourism is great for the tourist, just like yeah. Colonialism, colonialism was great for the colonists. Exactly. <laughs> definitely. So that's what's happening. That's that's definitely very uh, heartbreaking because even from what 
I have, you know, seen not just the news, but like different things that people post on like Facebook, like even because Peru has become poor and there's not that much work, people have migrated into Mm. Chile. Yeah. And how horrible are they being treated mm-hmm. there? Um Yeah. It, it it's definitely I'm like in shock right now. I had no idea how Chile pretty much owns Peru, like how China owns yeah. the US. Exactly. Um So I want to touch base on the relationship that you guys have together. How did you guys meet? <laughs> so, um I so we were talking about before how it was like for me, like what it was like just to be Peruvian and I said, "Well, what did it matter?" One day, and I'm telling you, it was like this. It was just like one day. One day it was all that mattered. Um, It was a sudden realization. So when that happened, I knew that I wanted to rediscover my roots, my culture, and to find my family. Um, I've how old are you? uh, In my twenties, early twenties, early twenties. And I took a look at my adoption papers. Um, And one of the things that I knew from my parents, because my my parents in the U.S. They had met um, my biological mother um, before when they were living in Peru, when they were going through the adoption process of me. Um, So they had told me, and I had always known this, that she was a Quechua speaker, not a Spanish speaker. She only spoke Quechua. So I knew that in reconnecting with her, I probably should learn a little bit of Quechua because otherwise we were not going to be able to communicate. So... Um, again, I, I was with the sudden realization and I just Googled like Quechua in New York city. Like what are my resources? Um, Elva is the first thing that popped up on a Google search, her movie living Quechua. Uh, I think I, I, I can't remember what year it was. I think it was already out, but, um, it said that this 13, woman, 14. Elva Ambia lived in Brooklyn. So I contacted um, the email address that was on the website, and I was like, I want to meet Elva. Like, where is she? And Christy, um, who had helped Elva start the Quechua Collective, Mm -hmm. yeah, she she had still been working with her at the time, and she had messaged me like, oh, um, just here's her phone number. Please give her a call. And I was very nervous because, again, I, I as I had expressed previously, I never really talked to a, for another Peruvian person before. Um, and it, it was very, it was very emotional. I, I cried like yeah, the first does, time that we met. It was, it was very, very emotional. I was very nervous to come here. Um, but, you know, we met and we had a great connection. I, I honestly, I don't know, like, for my soul what I would do without Elva. Um, I know. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I was, I was so lost. I was so not not who I am today and that doesn't mean to say that I have it all together making up on 20 plus years um of trying to reclaim a culture a language and an identity that was denied to me um has been very difficult but it has been made much easier with Elva yeah I remember when she came and told me how could I find my mother Mm. um they say she uh, is from uh, Apurimac. She told me that. And I know I lived in Apurimac, but in Chincheros. But then she said, in Andahuayla. So, so I, I said, nowadays, with the technology, it's easier. Mm-hmm. So that gave her the clue. She got into her phone. <laughs> Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Very I, I... fast. Yeah, I messaged just anyone she who had messaged. the last surname, Juan Cocorri. Um, It must have been over yeah. hundreds of people. And um, I didn't limit my search to Peru. I messaged throughout South America, which, thank goodness, because the one person who got back to me was my cousin, who is living in Chile um, for employment opportunities, as <laughs> we were just speaking of. Um, mm-hmm. And he had said, oh, yes, I know her. But at that time, 
Um, not to say that it's much better now, but at that time, my Spanish was extremely limited. So I actually had him and Elvis speak to one another because we could not understand one another. And I was mm. not sure if this was real, <laughs> if this was yeah. actually happening. Yeah. We and talk yeah, and Elvis said it he's happened fine. that uh, it was her cousin. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then, of course, you know, the next day that I spoke to, I spoke to my mother over video chat, but again, we cannot that, understand that one way. another. So the yeah. next day I was so, like, Elva, now we have to talk in Quechua with my mother. <laughs> yeah. So I spoke with her. She was so excited, sad, and she cried. And, uh, you know, it was really very emotional for her and for me. Uh, and we made that connection. So the following year, she went to Peru, met her mother, her whole family. Not just one person, but the whole, it's a tribe. <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Yes, my family's large, and most of them still live in, in El Campo, in yeah. Cavita, which is about two hours outside of Andoilas. Yeah. That's beautiful. So, that kind of, like, a reminds me story. of, like, the first time that I, like, came to, you know, one of your... Um, collective uh gatherings mm-hmm. like I remember I was outside and I got like super emotional I'm like oh my god and uh my aunt was also here mm-hmm. uh through a friend and my aunt she's actually part of the Hispanic Association and I was just like I came up uh, I came upstairs, I said hello to everybody, and I'm like, oh my god, a house full of Peruvian, that's not my family. <laughs> and, you know, when I sat down, and then um, you had, like, a band playing, that's when all, like, all that's the tears so started falling, because it's very hard to find places like that, where it's, like besides going online because sometimes it's like going online you're only getting like one thing you're not getting the full experience Mm -hmm. you had people here talking in quechua cantando in quechua playing indigenous instruments so i know how you felt Mm -hmm. like finding elva finding you guys definitely like even i'm still like super Mm -hmm. emotional Yeah. Yeah. yeah elva is also very inspiring to me um as a mentor Um, I really look up to her. I really admire um, all of the things that she's done um, with her life and with her work and through Quechua, through our language. Um, It's very inspiring to me. And also she's very inspiring as a mentor, as a woman of color. As I mentioned, growing up um, in a white community, I've mostly had white female role models, which is much different than having um, another woman of color that I can look up to. Um, And I really value that. Thank you. And I do too, because she's my right hand. Without her, I don't think I can do things that I do now. <laughs> yeah. So how many Peruvian people do you know now, Jessica? Oh, tons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot your, of your brothers and sisters alone is alone. like 10 people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and we, you know, it's it's the yeah. the value that we have in having those community gatherings is so it's so great for me. It's so great for the community. It's so great to know everyone. Yeah, it's wonderful. So, what is the next step for the Quechua Collective? Well, we have lots of dreams, but the dreams are coming. Um, you know, make being reality. Like, uh, I had a dream that I was going to write a book about, you know, just a story that will reflect the um, two children from different parts of the world meeting and, and teaching each other their languages and culture. So that's the Coricha number one. And now we're working on the Coricha number two, who, who which is... Um, the 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 child from uh, New York mm-hmm. inviting Coricha from Peru mm-hmm. to come here, so he's going to meet this whole new world, new community, and also in that book we're showing the process of the immigration, mm-hmm. how 
how you know to get the visa how to get the passport and how to how um they have to work so hard definitely in order to get some money to go from their little town to another bigger town and then from that bigger town to another you know because only uh, lima processes visas mm -hmm. so we're showing all of that in that book and 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 one of my dreams was to create a school Quechua school we have our Quechua school it's working really wonderful um, we we already have how many years of that three years Long four time now. maybe like four since years 2016 Evan would you say since 2016 yeah, yeah. since 2016 yeah four years Long time and we had reached out to so many uh, students, um, young and, um, you know, middle, <laughs> and um, Peruvians, Bolivians, and Americans, and from other parts. And they're learning Quechua because they want to visit Peru. And some of uh, the people uh, are young people who whose parents are from uh, the Andes from Peru, but they never spoke Quechua because they were for a shame or whatever reason. Like maybe like you. Yeah. Your roots are Andean, but you don't know how to speak Quechua. And uh, like, like you, there are students like that and they are learning Quechua and they want to go back to their families and speak. Uh, in this language yeah that's actually one of my dreams to like learn to speak Quechua yeah. like I have literally been telling you know my girlfriend I recently put her on like you need to listen to Renata Flores because now she's mixing Quechua with trap <laughs> music and we were just like she did um tijeras Mm, I love okay. that song. Oh my God. And we were just listening and the excitement on my girlfriend's face, like, oh my God, this is so awesome because <laughs> I've been waiting for such a long time to see that type of representation. You know, mm -hmm. although I, she does not like look like me, I have a lot of family members who look like her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tucani, remember? Yeah. He also does rap in Quechua. Ooh, yes. Put in me Square. on. Put mm -hmm. me on. Like, I've, I okay. definitely, you well, know, like, want to learn. Like, I don't open, have any. We're open. Our doors of New York Quechua Collective is open. Anybody who wants to join us can join us. Mm -hmm. Our school is open. You could just, um, you know, register and and learn where can we find a, the get yeah. collective is there like an email so, contact yes so, we do yeah we're on facebook at the Quechua collective um we're on instagram as Quechua collective and for any inquiries such as classes or um if you're interested in a collaboration if you're interested in just more information about Quechua, we're at ny Quechua at gmail.com um, mm -hmm. so for any inquiries please write there and Quechua is spelled Q-U-E-C-H-U-A awesome so alright y'all it's time for the one piece not to be confused with the widely popular anime that we all know and love this is that one piece of advice that you would give to a younger you. So let's start with Jessica. What advice would you give to a younger you going through all, you know, these feelings, finding out who you are, coming into your own? What would you say to you? This is really hard. Um, it's okay. It's okay. I think I would say to myself, um, don't be afraid to remember who you are. Mm. Because I, I think 
on some level, I was afraid. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you think that representation had something to do with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I said, the representation in my life was absent. So why did remembering who I was matter? And it was only to it was only until like I said it was like it just fell out of the sky um that it mattered. But it should have always mattered. And I think if maybe I had more representation, whether that be like real life representation or representation in the media, um, for example, like we do have some positive representation going on right now um, with the Dora, La Exploradora movie, <laughs> um, you know, something like that, that would have kept it in my mind um, that I was who I've always been. Um, I think that would have helped. Mm -hmm. Y Elva, mm -hmm. what piece of advice would you give to a younger you? I think do more. If I wanted to preserve the Quechua language uh, that at young age I would have uh, spoken spoke the Quechua language freely in school, in the community, um, because uh, we didn't actually do that. I mean, I learned it because in this community, almost everybody spoke Quechua. And my father was a judge, so people will come with their, um, you know, complaints, quejas, um, hoping that he will resolve their problems, their situations, and I watched everything, and that's how I learned. And I was maybe three, four, five years old. That's how the Quechua got in my brain, and I, I loved it. And um, But I did not speak Quechua until I was grown up, when I came here, actually. Um, I started speaking more when I don't remember exactly the year, but it must have been uh, 2013. No, before we went to the library to get the books, mm. I think they invited me to be in the carroza for El Desfile de la Hispanidad. Mm -hmm. So I went in this carroza and for the first time, I spoke with a mic in Quechua. I was mm -hmm. dressed up with a Peruvian costume like mm -hmm. that. And uh, at that time, I made such an impact speaking in Quechua in the microphone that people who were looking at me on the sidewalk as the carroza was passing by, they were crying, listening to what I was talking. They were crying. I never imagined that would happen, for that to happen. That, that inspired me tremendously to continue. So if I was a child, I should have speak more Quechua for everybody to, to know and 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 also uh, keep the clothing you know the same way they and the end people wear their clothes I would have say that little Elva to continue like that yeah is there to finish us off is there something that you would like to say in Quechua Mm. Runasimi. <laughs> I would like, uh, you know, um, uh, Nyokamunani Runasimi Kausanan Pak. Um, Tukui Yapang Runakuna Runasimi Tayachananta Munani. 
That was beautiful. Okay. And that means... Yo quiero que la gente aprenda a hablar el quechua. Y causa chung quechua, causa chung runacime, que viva el idioma quechua. Awesome. Thank you so much. Like my heart is so full right now. That's good. So full. Very good. Yeah, so I encourage you to take the class.